Andre Solo, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm really glad to have you. Uh, you're the co-author, along with Jen Groneman, of the 2023 book, which is not even yet 2023, not quite. Uh, and the book is Sensitive, The Hidden Power of the Highly Sensitive Person in a Loud, Fast, Too Much World. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you I'm, say that, David. Yes. Yeah, well, I'm trying to put the feeling in there that I think is in that title. <laughs> I really yeah. love the, the playfulness of that title. And so I do note that the book was a collaborative effort. So uh, what can you tell us about your collaboration with Jen? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So Jen and I have been working on this topic together for quite a few years now. We originally met through our work on introversion. We had a friend, a mutual friend who does podcasts and he wanted to launch an introvert podcast. And because we both write about that topic, he thought we would be good co-hosts. So he kind of did a group call to uh, to start talking about it. Oh. The podcast never happened, uh, but we did oh. start working together and eventually uh, built the, the website sensitiverefuge.com together, which is the world's largest community for sensitive people now. Um, and that eventually led to us, uh, you know, turning our research into a book. So, yeah. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's really turned out well. And you, in your introduction, I would alert uh, future readers that there's a great story about how you two got together, and it's very cleverly worked in there. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, how did you come to recognize? I assume that you consider yourself to be a highly sensitive person. I do. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. when, when did you come to that realization? And I guess it raises the question, too, of the definition. What do you mean when you say a highly sensitive person? Maybe I'm one, maybe I'm not. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question because uh, the word sensitive can mean different things in different contexts. Um, as a personality trait, being sensitive means that you are it, – it, it, it describes how much information you kind of pick up and process from your environment. And that includes things like emotional information. The more sensitive someone scores, the more likely they are to notice mm -hmm. um, any micro expressions and pick up on people's feelings and intentions just from processing all that information that, that we all see, but many of us screen out. But it also includes uh, just other sensory information. So noticing these tiny details in the colors, the shades of colors on things, the smells in a room, uh, the way, you know, maybe the, the bushes are rustling and it indicates there might be an animal in there, um, things like that. Again, these are things all of us can hear and see and, and pick up on, uh, but uh, most of us screen out a lot of that information and don't really pay attention to it. But the sensitive mind tends to process a lot more of it and much more at length to pick up uh, more nuance from it. So that's really what we mean by sensitivity. Everyone is sensitive to some degree. Um, and it just like most uh, temperamental and personality traits, it breaks down where, you know, most people are kind of in the middle, sort of average. Yeah, sensitive. right. Some about 20 to maybe 30% are low sensitive, and then some about roughly 30% are high sensitive uh, or highly sensitive people. And yeah. it just changes the way you see the world. It kind of changes the way you experience life because for you, for us, uh, everything is kind of turned up a little bit compared to what it might be for other people. Yeah. Now, you started off talking about the uh, podcast that didn't come to pass, which was <laughs> about about introversion. Yes, and yeah. so. Um, are, is, is the highly sensitive person really a synonym for introversion? Yeah, that's something we hear a lot. And, you know, honestly, at an earlier point, uh, scientists sort of thought maybe that was the case. These are you know, just another word for introverted people. Uh, that is definitely not the case. So uh, highly sensitive people, uh, or I'll just call them sensitive people for short, uh, can be introverted or extroverted. Um, they tend to lean, like on average, they're maybe more likely to be introverts than the general population, but not by that much. It's like a 70-30 split uh, with a lean toward extroverts, uh, sorry, a lean toward introverts. So um, the difference is that being introverted or extroverted is sort of an orientation, uh, sort of a social orientation, right? Being an introvert describes how you get your energy. You get your energy not from being around people but from having time alone to think and, and, and just sort of be with your own thoughts. 
um, and being around people drains that energy. But sensitivity is more of an orientation towards your entire environment. And it describes you know, how deeply you react to that environment. So an extroverted sensitive person might be someone who absolutely loves people uh, and likes to spend time around them and even gets energy from them. But because everything in their environment is a little bit uh, louder or impacts them a little bit more, they might prefer to get that people time in small one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one groups uh, rather than a huge party. They might prefer yeah. quiet restaurants and places like that to meet people uh, and maybe even shorter social events rather than an all-night marathon. So that's kind does, of the difference. Does that change over time? Because I feel like I was probably more extroverted or would have seemed to be more extroverted uh, when I was younger. But as I've gotten older, uh, you know, I've got a handful of friends and that's enough. Yeah, right. Yes, yeah. Uh, other <laughs> than needing a, a huge audience <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and my right. own podcast for 16 years. Other than that. <laughs> other than I'm that, very, yeah. Personal life, yeah. Uh, no, that absolutely happens. I think the, you know, in general, temperament doesn't change a ton over the course of your life after the time you're roughly maybe in your early 20s. Um, but it does change somewhat. And for introversion and extroversion, generally speaking, people do become slightly more introverted as they get older. And that makes sense kind of from an evolutionary perspective, right? When you're younger, you know, kind of if you think of us more of a species and less as, as people yeah. living in a society you know you're looking for mates you're, you have to go out and meet more people um i was looking for mates very hard very intensely <laughs> very hard exactly <laughs> yeah and you know younger people may don't necessarily have as many resources or as much status so the more they can get out and form connections uh then the better it is for them when you get older you don't necessarily need to do those things and spend your energy on that so you kind of whether you're an introvert or an extrovert to start off with you slide a little more introverted over time and with sensitivity, we see something different, which is that sensitive people, uh, however sensitive you may have been kind of wired to be by your genes, right, which is a component of it, it's not all of it, but your environment changes how sensitive you are. And there's some evidence to suggest that sensitivity actually continues to change a little bit more over the course of life than some other traits do. Still, you know, mostly sets mostly sets in in your younger years and you know, kind of determine how sensitive you are, but it does shift in response to life circumstances. And sensitivity tends to uh, increase if you're in one of two situations, if you're either in a really, really good situation or a really, really bad situation. If you're sort of in a middle of the road situation, there's not much reason for your uh, mind to become, for your brain, to become uh, more sensitive. And the reason for that is that as a sensitive person, you get more out of the good things in your life. If you're getting mentorship, if you're getting, uh, if you're doing networking, if you're getting opportunities, if you're going to therapy, any of these things that will help anyone across the board, they actually pay off more, uh, have a, a larger measurable effect in the, in the outcomes for highly sensitive people because they're doing that deep processing, they're taking more from it. So if you're in a situation in life where things are going really well, you have a lot of social support, sometimes people will start to score higher for sensitivity because they're, they're, you know, their entire wiring is saying, wow, we should ramp up sensitivity and get more out of this while we can. And then on the other end of the, spec of, the, of the continuum, if you're going through a really bad, stressful period in life, it also pays off to be more sensitive because being more sensitive means you're more alert to the next threat in your environment. It means that you might pick up on little cues as to how to read the tea leaves of a situation, and maybe it won't go so bad as it might have otherwise. If you're unfortunately in a toxic or abusive situation, it can even help you survive. Um, and so in those very stressful circumstances or those really supportive circumstances, we see sensitivity go up, especially in kids, but even later in life. And then middle of the road, you kind of just stay at the sensitivity level that you were at generally. Yeah, I noticed that earlier you said that you scored uh, high on, sensi on sensitivity and not so high on what's the opposite of the sensitivity. In other words, the way you said it, it didn't sound like there were polar opposites, but that the scales can be considered independently. Interesting. Yeah. So sensitivity itself is a continuum. So people will be either low, average, or high. And you kind okay. of move a little bit along that scale. 
Um, and you sort of start off, you know, in, in, your, in your first few months of your life, we can already detect sensitivity, uh, even in just infants, which is how we kind of first discovered this trait, um, because some infants will, uh, you know, you make the slightest peep, you tiptoe past the crib, and the infant bolts awake and starts crying. <laughs> they pick right. up on that, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I have a 22-month-old son who was very much like that as a baby, you know. I love oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. Always easy with a, a highly reactive child like that. And other babies are much more like, well, unless you're shaking the rattle right in my face, I'm just not going to react that much. So yeah. we right away. And that's determined in, in a large part by your genes, whether you're kind of high, average, or low. But then over the course of childhood and somewhat in adulthood, uh, those life experiences will start to adjust it a little bit up or down. So your genes kind of put you in the ballpark of how sensitive you'll be. And then your life experiences sort of fine tune it over time. Yeah, I remember stories that my mother would tell, and it's going to sound like an abusive childhood, but uh -huh. uh, that they had to put me in, in the closet because I would uh, be so sensitive to mm -hmm. any noise or anything. And, and I think, uh, I assume I was in a bassinet or a drawer or something in the closet and uh, and that I was okay with it. Um, and I compared that with, we ha had four children and uh, one of them, we were fearful that maybe he was deaf. They, they were twins. We have twins, not identical. But um, one of the guys, uh, we were thinking, oh my God, is he deaf? And went up behind his high chair, you know, and I clapped my hand or got a pan and banged on it. And he didn't bat an eye, but he's not deaf. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's just like shrugging it off, basically. It, yeah. 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 Just yeah. somehow, somehow uh, uh, did that. So well, it's interesting uh, what you said about, yeah. you know, your parents would, would sort of sequester you in this closet because you were so sensitive to your surroundings. And I, I relate right. to that really hard. I mean, you asked earlier kind of how I discovered I'm a sensitive person. And the truth is, I didn't understand that until adulthood. Um, I've been, of course, I've been sensitive my whole life. Uh, but as a child, I did not know why I was different from other kids. And even at recess like in kindergarten, because everyone's, you know, they've got kickballs, they're yelling, they're running everywhere. And I love to right. play around as much as the next kid, but there was just too much going on after also having just done class for the previous hour. Um, and I would just run off. I would run off and, and I actually started hiding. It's it's maybe even worse than a closet. I would sit hiding in this old storm sewer uh, pipe that wasn't too far away. And I would come back at the end of research, you know, I would come back and go to class. Sure. But people yeah. started wondering, where, where did you go? And eventually the teacher <laughs> found out where I went. We had to talk with my parents. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that does sound like a sign <laughs> there. <laughs> um, now, are there myths and misunderstandings in relation to? Being a sensitive person, do do people have opinions about that? Society have opinions? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, there's so much stigma around being sensitive. Um, you know, it's it's. I think the first thing is that we also use the word sensitive in our society to mean being easily offended, right? And that's yeah, yeah. perfectly valid use of the word, but that's not what is meant by sensitive as a personality trait. Um, you know, sensitive people are just as likely or unlikely to be offended by something as, as anybody else. Um, but so that creates some confusion. But even sensitivity itself, um, the trait of being sensitive, it comes with these huge gifts that society does want. Things like being creative, things like having empathy and compassion. Uh, sensitive people can often become innovators. And they often, you know, notice things or make connections that other people miss, which means that they can solve problems that other people can't solve. They can sometimes come up with better decision making uh, and kind of better long term uh, plan than somebody who is more of a shoot from the hip kind of person might. So a lot of really valuable traits. But not all gifts come with a downside, but sensitive gifts do come with one cost. And that's that your brain is doing all of this processing crunching so much information to give you this added insight. And it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of effort. So if you're in an overwhelming situation, if it's a, a really fast deadline that you have to get done, if a bunch of people are talking at you at once, if there's too much going on in the room around you while you're trying to focus, um, things that are common in a lot of occupations, um, that can become overstimulating. And that brain just cannot keep up with all of that information coming in 
So sensitive people become uh, fatigued. They become sometimes cranky. I, I can vouch for that myself. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and we just get this brain fog if there's too much going on. So we get overstimulated. And yeah. I think it's led to a lot of the stigma where it's, you know, you have this idea that sensitive people, well, we just can't hack it, right? Or they need to toughen up. They need to be able to handle what everybody else can handle. Um, we can toughen up if we need to. Like We can certainly work on a little bit of endurance here and there if it's absolutely necessary. But that also is going to sacrifice those gifts that society really wants from us. And I think what we've seen, uh, what Jen and I have seen a lot in, in kind of talking both to sensitive people and to you know people who would not identify as being sensitive, is that there's sort of this, um, people want one side of the coin without the other. They want all the gifts that sensitive people can provide, all the creativity, all the art, all, yeah. the all the inventions, all the caring and kind, loving partner, but they don't necessarily want that. Well, ha, huh, why are you overstimulated? Why can't you finish this party that we were planning to go to? Why, you know, why can't you keep up with this deadline? Um, but it really is, it's a, it's a package deal. And uh, when, when we give sensitive people mm -hmm. a little bit of extra space, a little bit of extra time to process, uh, they can really uh, be brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I'm remembering uh, that I, when I was in graduate school, I, I was married and uh, we were living in, in Ann Arbor where I was at the University of Michigan as a graduate student. And it was uh, the, the, the uh, collection of friends that we had was kind of a hang loose sort of atmosphere with students and so on. And we would have people over to our house, but as the evening wore on, uh, I would actually have the nerve to start going down. And say, okay, it's time to leave. Everybody leave. <laughs> and my, my, my wife harkens back to that, and she found it rather shocking, you know, <laughs> that, that I would do that. I would kick people out of the house. But it's kind of like you were just describing it. It reached a place where it was too much, you know. I was fun, but, hey, there becomes a time <laughs> when you need to go back to your house. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've I've really embraced the so-called Irish goodbye for that reason, where I'll just leave an event or a party just without saying anything. And I, I have to fight against every sensitive instinct in my body that says, this is rude. But it's like, no, this, this, I'm, I'm out of energy and I'm going to get out of here. And, and yeah. this way I wait another half hour of people begging me to stay or saying goodbye or something else. So yeah, yeah. 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 Let me ask you about your own background because uh, yeah. you're you're talking very knowledgeably about uh, uh, therapy and and the science of this stuff. Um, but I take it you're you're not a psychologist or a therapist, am I right? That's correct. I'm not yeah. So so, so what is, what is your background? Right. What's yeah. your authority here for right. talking right. about this? <laughs> Right, right. That's that's fair. Uh, so Jen and I both have more of a, a background as journalists. So we come at this from the perspective of this fascinates us. We've lived through this experience. What is the science and what is it that uh, people are not understanding about this topic that needs to get out in the world? And uh, that's sort of how we've approached this. That and the fact that we're both highly sensitive people ourselves, both struggled for a long time to accept that and to understand how to use it in our lives and had to overcome that. Um, and in terms of our other work, so Jen, uh, you know, besides being a journalist, she previously worked as a teacher as well. Um, and myself, I've worked in nonprofits. I've worked with an educational nonprofit that uh, that one studies the psychology of heroism, a little bit of a different topic. And I have uh, co-authored some academic work as well, but you're absolutely correct. I'm not a psychologist. I'm a journalist and somebody who's lived through it as well. <laughs> uh, well, actually, as confrontive as my question might have sounded, uh, journalists are among my favorite guests. Oh, because, <laughs> why is that? Yeah, bec well, because they they really research whatever whatever they're writing about. They mm. do a lot of a lot of research on it, and uh, you know, and they're artic they are articulate. And uh, they just make really great guests, and, ah. and so so you're in that camp. You don't don't feel like you have to justify yourself because I I know that you've looked into the science of it, and um, and I'm interested in that because I'm getting the impression from some things that you've said that that there is a science of it that I wasn't aware of. I mean, I know they've studied infants for a long time development and all 
but I wouldn't have put it in the, this category of the highly sensitive person. Maybe that's kind of emerged over time as its own category. Yeah, it really has. It's um, And it's a fairly recent field, but one that's kind of exploded. So I would say as recently as the 1980s, there was no such thing as a science of sensitivity per se. Um, some of the kind of groundwork research that, that led to it was being done, which includes the work with the infants, you know, either some crying easily and some not that I mentioned. Um, yeah. By the 90s, uh, a couple of researchers, most notably Elaine Aaron, who is the person who coined the term uh, highly sensitive person. Uh, she uh, was doing research about it as sensitivity per se. And very importantly, she was not viewing it as a negative trait. And right. that was important change because previously, um, I would say that a lot of the previous researchers came to respect it, you know, so uh, Jerome Kagan, who did the research with infants, sort of started out thinking, oh, these infants who cry easily, there must be something wrong with them, maybe they're neurotic, maybe there's a, a, something we have to overcome to help fix them. He had this very negative mindset, there must be a problem if they're crying that easily. Yeah. I mean, yeah. as a parent who has to respond to every cry, I can understand, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but over the course of his research, and many of these kids he would work with then later when they were, you know, a little older and then were teenagers and even went back to as adults and continued to do personality inventories and see how this changed or stayed the same over time. Mm. And he came to really respect it as sort of like it's different, but just as as valuable in different ways as being less what he would call reactive. I would but say was, that's that's something that's happening in psychology and psychotherapy generally quite a bit is yeah. to try to back away from some of the the judgmental sounding labels that yeah. have been used you know yeah. like oh my god i have that you know it sounds <laughs> like the end of the world whatever it is and so we have people who are proudly proclaiming you know that they suffer from manic depression or mm. or other other uh mental health categories that uh had very strong sort of judgmental tone, you know, uh, around that. So this to me seems to be in that flow. And I think that, that um, who was it? Jerome Kagan, was it? Yes, correct. Yeah, I think he was on the faculty actually at the University of Michigan when I was there, but such a huge place, huge department. I never took any courses from him or, or got yeah. to really, really know his work. But I did interview somebody years ago, about 10, 10 or nine or 10 years ago, by the name of Ted Zeff. Oh, of course, or, Ted, yes, yeah. Oh, so he is an, a known name. <laughs> Good. He is, he's a very known name in the among uh, kind of sensitive uh, authors and sensitive community, yeah, right. Yeah, he was really a um, on fire about it. You know, I guess he identifies with it and really felt like, hey, this is something people need to be aware of and, and to know that it exists and, and that you're okay if you're that way. Yeah, so He's one of the early evangelists, I guess. Yes, he he's an early evangelist. And that experience you just described, that how he kind of was set on fire by learning about this, that <laughs> is what happens to highly sensitive people when they finally learn about this trait. Most of us yeah. spend... A lot of our life being told, uh, toughen up, you're overreacting, you know, you need to change in some way. Our parents think they're helping by trying to, quote unquote, fix us. Later in yeah. life, our colleagues, our, our lovers, everyone else, you know, has sort of this, uh, well, let's try to get that part of you off center stage, right? right. Um, and uh, when you start to understand that this is a part of your personality and that it's linked to giftedness among all of, of, of all things, right? Um uh -huh that you can start to understand yourself in a new light. And uh, I think that's exactly what happened to Ted Seth. I think he's very passionate about it and he writes about that in his book. And I think I relate to that too, because I, you know, one of the moments where I finally, it finally clicked, like, no, I'm definitely a highly sensitive person was this, this study I read that was by a researcher and she used her own son as a case study, just as an example of a highly sensitive child and basically described his first year of, uh, I forget it was kindergarten or first grade, one or the other, um, at a school where it was a very normal school. Um, but you know, the teacher was a little bit on the disciplinarian side. It was a very large class size. There's a lot of yeah. right? 
Um, and he would just come home. I mean, the kid's like six or seven years old. He'd come home every day, uh, like unhappy. Like I hate school and and I'm just TV right. cranky and everything else. And, you know, she eventually realized that my child is highly sensitive and just switched him to a different school where he had a classroom that was a little bit smaller, a little bit quieter, and importantly, a teacher with a different approach who was, you know, open to, oh, okay, so this kid just needs a little bit of a different, you know, tone than some of the other kids. Right. Did. Yeah. Uh, and it was night and day. He started loving school. He became a star student. And, you know, sure enough, he kind of rocketed forward after that. But it was reading her description of all the things her son did, all these quirky little things about sure. one or two close friends and not a bunch of friends, about, you know, running away at recess, all these different things. I was like, just checking the list as I read through this. I'm like, uh, she's describing me. I mean, she's describing her own son, but this is my yeah. child she's describing. Yeah. And yeah, it's like, wow. sick, you know, and you feel like you finally understand yourself. Yeah, so many kids or uh, some portion of kids have a really difficult time in school and uh, are shunned and, and, you know, clicks are so such a big thing these days. And, uh, of course, the Internet brings a new set of horrors to it, can magnify some of, some of the difficulties. Um, and then it turns out that those kids that just do are so unhappy, say, in junior high, particularly junior mm -hmm. high and often on into high school, and then later they, in college or somewhere, or maybe they drop out of school, but some emerge as geniuses, as very gifted people who just, this was not a good environment for them. And, and they flourish when they could go out and do their own thing. Yeah. yeah and so, so, so there are definitely learnings there for people in education. And, um, and, and probably for parents, too. What are the implications of all this research uh, for, for parenting? It's, it's one of my favorite questions. It's, um, I would say about half the people who uh, read what Jen and I write are highly sensitive people themselves. And probably the other half are parents who have a sensitive child, and they're just wondering, what do I do? Is this a bad thing? Is it a good thing? What am I supposed to do different? Yeah. Like, how do I raise the sensitive child? Um, and, you know, the answer is just like, go a little slower and go a little easier, right? Just kind of be, be a gentle and reaffirming about everything. And specifically, uh, you know, sensitive children tend to, I mean, it's a blanket statement, not a hundred percent accurate, but, um, tend to just really want to be good kids. They usually like pleasing their parents or pleasing teachers, um, you know, there's a certain level of conscientiousness there and of you know, they are more attuned to people's feelings. They just legitimately don't want to irritate other people. Yeah. Or adults. Um, and like any other kid, they're going to mess up or they're going to get overstimulated or they're going to get, you know, carried away with a friend and they will do things, of course, they get them in trouble. They're not perfect. Um, but they tend to have like a, a desire to want to be like a good kid, so to speak. Um, and all you have to do is just like give them the runway to do that. And so what yeah. that looks like is, um, I'll give you an example from my own life. So I, I don't know yet if my son is going to turn out to be a, a highly sensitive person or not. He showed some signs of it as an infant, but I'm going to let him unfold and see whatever he is, he becomes is fine with me. Um, but he loves dancing. He just loves dancing. And I decided, okay, there's a, a the toddler dance class that we can go to. It's very basic, but it'll teach the fundamentals and we'll start going. And it's, you know, they're so young at that age that the parent does the class with them. We like do these things together. So we yeah. go to the dance class and I'm like, he's going to love this. He's so into dancing and he's just crying the whole time. He just does not want to be there. I'm like, oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh. Uh, but about, how, you know, after a little while, I thought to myself, well, we're in a big room with bright lights, with like, not that many people, but like six or seven other parents with one or two kids each, plus the teacher. There's music playing. It's changing every couple minutes. And he's never been here before. And we're all kind of just like in a circle almost, all out among each oh, other. Sure. And I just thought, well, what would I want as a sensitive kid? I would want to back off a little bit and observe before we do this. So I just picked us up and moved us farther out of the circle, a little bit back toward the wall. So now you can see everyone. We're not surrounded, right? And it's more of he can observe. And over the course of the rest of the class, he began kind of getting into it, smiling and laughing, and eventually doing some of the movements. So it's oh, just good. 
that simple step of like yeah. party. And when you get to the party, your friend's birthday party, you don't have to run in and play with everyone right away. We can just walk into the backyard and see what they're up to and watch for 10 minutes. That's fine. You know, um, not pushing a sensitive child to just immediately engage with other kids, immediately run out and make friends. They will make friends. I promise you. They'll actually yeah, these, do a job doing that if they're given a little yeah. time to kind of warm up. Go ahead. Yeah. These, these are great tips um, yeah. that you're giving here. Uh, and also their implications for the workplace. You've kind of referred to work environments that uh, I guess are some, it's going to depend uh, on the employer and the, uh, a lot of environmental factors, I guess, uh, how comfortable a person will feel, particularly if they're a highly sensitive person. Yeah. There, there are probably some, some, uh, environments that would just be horrible and others that could be very supportive yeah you know there to an extent there are um but i like to say that the the best career for a highly sensitive person is whatever career that person wants to do uh, <laughs> yeah. and highly sensitive people can absolutely thrive in just about any environment you can imagine. It could be a fast paced sales environment. It could be a, an aggressive, uh, you know, whatever kind of role you might imagine. Huh. Yeah. And does that mean that's the easiest one for them? No, not necessarily. Right. But we've spoken to highly sensitive people who are happy in the military. We've spoken to highly sensitive people of all walks of life, some of whom huh. do the kinds of jobs you wouldn't think of as, oh, that's a sensitive job. Um, of course, there's also plenty of others who are, you know, nurses, doctors, um, caretaking positions, things that you might think of as sensitive, but there's also sensitive people who are, are welders and they're happy with that. You know, they like, they like that trade. Um, but the key to whatever job you do is that you have to learn how to either control your environment or control your time in some way. Yeah. Your space, I should say. Now, you know, in, in an ideal world, that would mean we don't have an open office. Uh, I think open offices were bad for everybody. They were especially bad for sensitive people. Um, a sensitive person does better when they have uh, some privacy while they do their work, when they can go out and engage with the team in a collaborative yeah. way when they have to, when it's, what's, when it's helpful, but they can also retreat back to somewhere that they can just work on their laptop or their computer, or whatever it might be, more focused. Um, that's true of every, almost everyone to some degree, but especially highly sensitive people. Um, working from home has helped that in some ways for, for jobs where that's allowed and whether it's possible. Um, but your environment, if you can't control like your, to, I would say this, to the extent you can, can control your environment, whether that means personalizing your cubicle. I remember when I worked at a museum, I brought in a really nice, I was just thinking cubicle with like the carpeting walls. It was just like very beige and depressing to my sensitive soul. No yeah. natural but I brought in a lamp with a shade and a, a softer bulb. So I didn't have to have the fluorescent tubes directly over my cube. I could see the ones around me, but not the ones right over me. Uh, had a softer light. I put up some art in the cubicle and, and it started to feel more like, oh, I feel good working here. We're very sensitive to aesthetics as sensitive. People. Yeah, so right. Place your space to the extent you can. And then if you can't control your time at work, if you have the kind of, of work uh, situation where it's very much prescribed, you have to do this and then this and then this and then this you need to do something to control your time out of work. And by that, I mean, you're building into your day. This is my either my morning routine that gets me refreshed and in the right mindset when I enter work, or this is my routine when I leave work and I'm gonna kind of destimulate and process a little bit by doing this for a half hour every day. Uh, in my my personal room at home, my off, my home office, or my, you know, my, my corner with my cozy chair, whatever it might be for you, you have that time to sort of decompress um, and then figure out how you can build it into your workday as well. And sensitive people do this to some extent naturally, but, you know, bathroom breaks are a great chance to get five minutes apiece or going to your car for lunch and just like taking part of your lunch break to sit there and with your yeah. eyes open, just think rather than, you know, going to the cafeteria or out for lunch with friends. Yeah. Well, I guess through this website that you guys do, um, uh, you get a lot of information to see the the full range. Uh, I gather it's. I've been on the site, and I have to say, I'm impressed by uh, how rich it is on uh, information and tips, and uh, uh, it just looks like it's a tremendous resource. And I never would have thought, I wouldn't have imagined that 
there would be a big audience for that. If I was going to, <laughs> if I was going to try to invent a great website or mm. a great podcast, it would not occur to me that oh, here's a here's a large group of people, but it looks like it's a very large group of people. Yeah, yeah, it really is. I mean, so just by the numbers, nearly one in three people in the world would score as highly sensitive if they were given the the, the test. Um, that's and it's true for both men and women. Uh, men are just as likely to be highly sensitive as women are. Um, I think to some extent we express it differently, um, and I think to some extent, of course, men, a lot of men, including myself, when I was at a younger point in my life, don't want to say that word about themselves. It doesn't sound maybe manly in a traditional sense to say. Right, it. right. Um, and I think it's easy to forget that um, being sensitive is is an asset in sports. Uh, a lot of great athletes are very sensitive because you're processing more data from the field around you. I uh, I think Wayne Gretzky is probably a sensitive person. I think Tom Brady is probably a sensitive person. Yeah. I, I would bet money on it. I wouldn't bet money in a game, but I would bet money on on either of those two testing as highly sensitive uh -huh. yeah. um, because they just they they're so aware of the whole field and uh, and that's a sensitive trait. And other things about their their you know if you read about them a little bit as well, they kind of give it away. Um, similarly, I mean, there's a term that we usually hear in the context of the military, which is uh, situational awareness. And it's also a term used in policing and security. It's also a term used in hospitals where we have to keep patients alive. The idea being that you have to be aware of your immediate surroundings and what's happening and what that means for you and the people you're working with or your team or whatever else. You have to be aware of your situation. And that's a skill most people have to learn. It doesn't mean that highly sensitive people are automatically masters of it, but they have an advantage at that. Highly sensitive people are automatically more aware of their surroundings and other people because they're processing more data from those surroundings. And they notice the emotional level of those surroundings too, not just the other levels. Um, and that's considered a trait that it can save, it can save a Marine's life in combat. It can save a patient's life in a hospital. So there is, of course, sensitive does mean empathy and compassion and being emotionally warm. And it does mean, you know, maybe needing a little extra time to think about something. You have to process process things. I'm a chronic overthinker. I know a lot of sensitive people feel the same way. Um, so those are traits we think of as sensitive that are sensitive. But there's also these this other side that we often don't talk about of, you know, yeah, it's a, an advantage in a lot of, of survival situations. Um, so I think as men start mm -hmm. to understand the many different ways that being sensitive can can manifest, there's sort of more and more men who are like, yeah, you know, maybe I am sensitive and I, I guess I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, and I guess we would have to say that there's evolutionary uh, reasons for that have been selected for, for yeah. uh, for for our survival, not as individuals but as groups, and that you know, uh, so-called primitive groups would recognize that this person is has a kind of sensitivity, uh, mm -hmm. as you said, a situational awareness, or you know, or reads things is so sensitive that it borders or perhaps is psychic, you know, that they can kind right. of reach out and know what's going on <laughs> yeah, in, yeah. in a very large sense. Because, you know, because, you know, there's more and more thinking and research that points to the fact that we're all connected mm -hmm. to everything, to everything that we think that, that when we say I, we tend to think that the border is right here. Uh, yeah. Mostly in my head and and with my skin, this envelope. But in fact, we are getting information and energy from the galaxy, from the sun, from the moon, mm. from all over the place that affects us in different ways. So yeah, my, my mind is, my brain is spinning out with what you're saying. I was glad that you went to the military because I was thinking of, uh, I was thinking of the negative side of being drafted. You know, I had to worry about that. Fortunately, I didn't get drafted. But people are pressed into combat or survival situations, war situations. Yeah. And uh, so, but the sensitivity could make a person feel like, wow, they're really not equipped to deal with this. But on the other hand, there are people who uh, 
will have survival skills be- arising from that mm-hmm. sensitivity. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, you know, um, this trait of, of environmental sensitivity has shown up not just in humans, but in at least 100 other species that biologists have isolated this trait in. Um, many of which are, you know, some of which are related to us, like other primates, but many of which are completely unrelated, various fish and things like that. Um, and it comes up over and over in nature because it's useful. It's useful in a survival situation. Right. And you know, for humans, that often means sort of good decision making and sort of long term planning and um, one of my favorite studies that was done actually used a computer simulation where they essentially made lots of little creatures to navigate a, a you know, a virtual environment. Um, and some of them were programmed to act like sensitive people or sensitive creatures. <laughs> they would spend more of their own energy to uh, pick up and retain information about their environment, whereas other uh-huh. creatures would be a little more energy efficient and not spend as much energy on that. And over the course of many generations of the simulation, uh, the more sensitive individuals amassed more resources and had a higher success rate overall. Um, in gen, in most of the simulations, as long as it wasn't a hundred percent of people, if everybody's sensitive, right, then it kind of yeah. cancels out. We're all competing really well for the same resources. But when it's about the the twenty to thirty percent uh, that we actually have of sensitivity in the real world, it's a very useful trait for any species. For humans, we're a social species, so it also pays off for the people around a sensitive person. And I think that there is a lot of truth to what you're saying about um, this connection where it can almost seem mystical. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the advisors and wise people uh, in you know ancient cultures or traditional cultures were people who would have scored highly sensitive because they would or have- or or current ones where they become or current ones, yeah, yeah, clergy or or yeah. counselors or therapists or uh, consultants of one sort or another. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, cool. What one of the things I was that I learned in your book uh, early on was you refer to an early sociologist, Georg Simmel. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I had never heard of him. Uh, let's bring the audience uh, up to speed on Georg Simmel. Sure, yeah. So <laughs> Georg Simmel is, uh, you're exactly right. He was a philosopher who started doing sociology and was essentially one of the first sociologists uh, in history, right? Um, and kind of pioneered this field. And he covered all kinds of topics. But in, in Austria Mexico, or Germany, where was he? He was uh, he was born in, I want to say, Munich. I believe that's right. But then he was in Dresden uh, at the period that we talk about in the book. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so 1903, right? And if you think about this, this was the time when uh, when Picasso was, was going with his artist friends to the Moulin Rouge in Paris, this is a time when really modernity was exploding uh, onto the scene. And you had electric lights going up in certain places. Uh, you had streetcars being added to every city that could possibly put them in. Uh, you had phonographs where you could listen to music in your home or at a, at a house party for the first time without a band. Um, all kinds of things. Uh, and just ripping up streets to put in new sewers, new pavement. Everything was modernizing and it was considered this wonderful, good thing. And the city of Dresden hosted this big exposition uh, to kind of celebrate modernity, but especially to kind of bring in signs of progress from other German cities and sort of showcase Dresden as the forefront of progress and and also kind of get ideas from other cities and how to further modernize. So it's a celebration of modernity. And they invited various speakers. And one of the speakers was Georg Simmel. Who better than this respected academic who wrote about society itself? And they asked him if he could give a talk on the effect of modernity and how it how it changes our mind, uh, how, how the modern mind is different than the, the earlier mind. And uh, he <laughs> he did not do what they wanted him to do. He showed up <laughs> we were ready for a guy who was going to tout modernity and this is making us better and it's enhancing our brains and everything else. And he showed up with a, a very different message. Um, and over the course of his lecture, he told all the luminaries of Dresden and everyone else assembled, um, that the modern world is so fast paced, so loud and demands so much of our mental energy uh, that it sort of crushes our spirit, that it leaves us worn out and sort of disconnected from the people around us. And he described in detail all these, you know, 
the garish gas lights and and everything else that you know modernity had brought, uh, which are signs of progress to most of the people there. And to be clear, he didn't want to get rid of those things. I think he loved modern medicine and streetcars and trains probably as much as anybody else did. Um, but he was noticing this effect it had on us, where people were um, they were moving faster, they had more stuff crammed into their day, uh, they were packed in with more people in the cities all the time, uh, crowded into a streetcar, kind of shoulder to shoulder. The streets themselves were messy and, and packed with people and horses and streetcars and everything else. Uh, at job hours were were changing. Uh, expectations around your work life balance might have been changing a little bit uh, already, even back then. And he really just put his finger on this. And it was not at all what the people who organized the event wanted him to say. The editor of the series actually almost threw his lecture out when they published the other ones. And he got someone else to give the right lecture, huh. to something else <laughs> in this place. Uh, but it caught on. Everybody else was nodding their heads like, yeah, I do feel worn out. I feel exhausted. Uh, I love the, the picture house we can go to once a week. But other than that, just exhausted. Um, and he was describing sensitivity. He he realized humanity is oh. a sensitive species. And the faster our pace of living goes, the more things we have to grab our attention. Um, and just the more packed our, our schedule and the demands on our mind are, it's not infinite how much mental energy we can put into something. It eventually you you kind of collapse, you get overloaded. Uh, and he put his finger on that. That's how all humans are. Uh, but what the thing he did not realize is that it's more true for some than others. And there's trade-offs in both directions. Yeah. Uh, if you think about how much more we've changed since 1903 to 2022, right? Um, at least back then when he was crammed into the streetcar, he could just look right. up and think and you didn't have, you know, notifications going off on your phone or an endless stream of addictive content that just forces you to look at it, Right. Um, so the world today has sort of doubled down even more on that modern problem, all the modern benefits. Like I love the internet. I love modern medicine. I love that we're exploring space. Um, so we get the benefits, but we've also doubled down on the, the cost of, of the toll it takes on, on overloading us. Yeah. Well, we really have, it's funny. His critique is, is as alive for us today as it was back then. Yeah. Uh, but in a somewhat different in response to other things, you know, other other uh, aspects of our current modernity that many of us are thinking twice or thrice about, yeah. saying, wait a second, you know, right. let's, let's do cost-benefits analysis here. Right. There may be, uh, yes, we recognize the benefits, but we've got to take into account the, the one of my favorite concepts these days are the unforeseen consequences mm, and, and, yeah. you know and the, there are just so many places where we see where we've tried to be planful try to like, consider things beforehand and even when we do that there are likely to be unforeseen consequences that are our brain power isn't enough to to sort out all of those possibilities mm, yeah Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I think we just went through this moment as a as a culture, you know, with the pandemic, uh, not in the way that anybody would have asked for, but it, it kind of forced a lot of people to just do less for a little while, um, for the worst possible reason and at a high human cost. But yeah. the, like, so the unexpected consequence was a lot of people stayed home for a while. Not everyone. Uh, we weren't all that lucky. Uh, as a self-employed person, I mostly worked the same hours during the pandemic as I would have before. Um, <sighs> but a lot of people just had like sudden amounts of downtime and it was really nice. Yeah. And now we have this this great resignation where people are just saying, well, maybe I'm not willing to to do so much work uh, to make a living. Maybe I'm OK with making a little less if it means I have a higher um, standard of, of, of personal life, a quality of life or just more time to be with my family or my friends or the projects I care about. Um, and we're starting to realize that in a real way. And it was interesting watching that unfold as Jen and I wrote the book. Um, because we had sort of started out saying, you know, uh, if if we continue to sort of go down this path that Simmel warned us about, uh, we will just keep overloading until everyone has to sort of quit, right? And then we watched it kind of play out as we <laughs> as we worked on the book. We're like, oh yeah, okay, well there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
Uh, where is this work going for you and Jen from here? Yeah. What, uh, as you look down down the road of unforeseen consequences. <laughs> but maybe where is where is it that what what's your the ambition for 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 you guys? Yeah, I think we have we have two goals that we want to accomplish with this book. And one is of course for sensitive people themselves, which is that I I want more people who are sensitive to understand that about themselves. And more importantly, to accept it. Because when you realize you have this trait, um, there are plenty of sensitive people out there who, who, because of what they've been told their whole lives, because of this messaging of like, oh, you, you, you're weak, uh, you need to toughen up, et cetera, et cetera, we internalize it. And we sort of think, okay, well, I know I'm sensitive, but I have to hide that or downplay it. No, that's it's part of your personality. You can't run away from it. You can't make it go away. It will always be there. And that's actually a good thing because it's this you know, trait that comes with tremendous gifts that not everyone has. And so the first thing that we want to see happen is I hope that as many people as possible who are sensitive start to accept that about themselves. And that is a life-changing moment for sensitive people. When you start yeah. to lead with being sensitive, you don't hide it anymore. You just tell people, you know, I'm a little sensitive, so I'm going to call it, uh, you know, short tonight. I'm going to leave a little early or, um, or you don't have to use that word necessarily. But if you start to set boundaries around the way you use your time and you start to present yourself, you show off your sensitivity as one of your lead traits rather than something that you hide. If it's just, you know, yeah, I feel emotional, so I'm going to express my emotion right now. Um, that's a powerful thing. And it's not just powerful in that it feels liberating, but it's also powerful in that it changes the way people see you because you're no longer acting like someone who should be stigmatized and needs to hide who they are. You're acting like somebody who's very proud of who they are and is very confident in what they have. And people start to see, wow, they're really good with people. Wow, you know, they really made me feel better when I was, yeah. you know, that person, they came up with a solution that nobody else on the team could come up with. So part of it for us is just, we want sensitive people to feel good about who they are and to accept and, and to know that you're not broken, you're, you're gifted, if anything. What's the second ambition? You said there are two ambitions. Yeah. The second one is for all the people out there who would not necessarily identify as sensitive. And I think that we want to change the way people think and talk about being sensitive. You might have a sensitive child, even if you're not a sensitive person yourself. Um, you might have a sensitive coworker who you don't always you know, get along with. You have very different work styles. Um, you might be the supervisor of sensitive employees. Uh, or be married to someone who is much more sensitive than you yourself are. And all of these things can cause friction. And we want it to be normal to just say, you know, you could, it's something you could say about yourself in a first date or in a job interview. And people would know what that means. They know that sensitive means, and they know that it's a good thing, and it means certain strengths and certain maybe, you know, areas that are not so strong. Um, and we just want to change the way that that word is is kind of reacted to. Um, and hopefully that leads to changes in workplaces. Hopefully it leads to changes in how we raise our kids. Uh, maybe it'll even lead to changes in the political realm. But whatever it might kind of lead to, if we can at least start to understand that being sensitive is a normal personality trait and it comes with a lot of strengths, uh, I think we'll start to see all the people around us a little bit differently. Well, that's a great uh, summary of for uh, for this interview, and I I want to thank you. It's uh, been my pleasure to meet you, and and you've kind of uh, expanded my thinking in this area. So, <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure uh, for me. Uh, well. I appreciate you having me here, David. Yeah, Andre Solo. Thanks for being my guest today on Shrink Radio.